come from Geelong, or just out of Geelong, about half an hour out of Geelong. My wife and I farm, we've got um, beef cattle and sheep, so about a thousand ewes, about 200 cows we carved down. I did start my career in Kerrang. I had four years in irrigation districts in the mid 80s, about the time Rob was around as well, so that's how we sort of knew each other from the start. But I moved further south uh, and started consulting in about um, 1990. Um, so I've done mainly dry land stuff, so when I was looking at those figures of megalitres of water, I remember when it was $10 a megalitre and it was associated with your land. Um, so the world's changed a lot, as Rob said. Um, this is going to be a bit different to all the other stuff we've been hearing this morning, um, because as the title says, it's around decision making. Uh, when I first started as a consultant, um, I spoke to a few dairy consultants that had been out in the, the game for a while. And I said, what makes a good farmer? And they said, the only difference between a good farmer, the top 20% of farmers and the rest, is their ability to make good decisions at the right time. That's what separated them. And when you look at all the data over the years, you can go back and those people that are making those good decisions at the right times are the ones that keep getting ahead. And I noticed a number of them in the work I've been doing. They just have this uncanny knack and you look at them and think, gee, they were lucky, they bought then, you know, they bought that land when it was cheap, oh, they did this when it was like this and like that. It's not luck. It's not luck, it's a skill. Okay? So, first message I want you to take out, decision making is a skill. It can be taught, you can learn it, and you can get better at it over time. Okay? So, first thing I want to start with. I'll do a couple of quotes. And this came from, the, both these quotes are from farmers. This is one in South Australia. Faulty decision making is as damaging to a farm business as faulty or dysfunctional equipment. I reckon if you had a cedar that had three of the tubes blocked and wasn't um, sowing right, you had a boom spray that had six of the nozzles blocked, you'd stop and you'd fix it. Okay? But boy, oh boy, I see some people make the same mistakes in their decision making year after year after year. So I just think of decision making, think of it as a bit of machinery, okay? If your irrigation wasn't working right, you'd fix it, okay? You wouldn't put up with it year after year after year. But sometimes I see this um, mistakes in decision making just repeated time and time again. Second one, this actually was a quote um, from a lady in Western Australia. I was doing a road show with the JRDC over in WA. And she said to us, just because we make decisions all the time doesn't mean we're good at making them. And I thought that was quite profound because I was talking about decision making. She goes, I've never been taught how to make a good decision. Why do you assume I can make a decision, a good one, and go through that process? So, question to you guys, when were you taught to make a good decision, and I put in brackets there, the same way you were taught to read, write, and do arithmetic? Because I reckon if you think back, how did I learn to do maths? You would have started off with things pretty simple. You would have done your times tables, and over the years, as you went to school, you progressively got better and better, and you were taught ways to do it, processes and, and steps to go through to do it. Same as the way you did reading, same as you would have done writing. Okay? What you wrote in primary school would be different to what you might have written in year 12. Why? Because you progressively got better at it. As you got more practice, you were taught things, you got better at it. I can tell you decision making is exactly the same. Okay, there is a process and there are some skills that you can adopt uh, that can make that process better. I'm going to show you one towards the end. Um, it's an irrigation one that I tried to, to put together. Um, we'll see how we go. But before I do that, I want to just highlight a few things I reckon that are key in around the decision making space. First one, I want to separate between a good and a right decision. What do you reckon the difference is? between a good and a right decision? What do you reckon the difference might be? What makes someone, something a right decision? If it feels right. If it feels right, okay, so there's a bit of gut in that. It's right or wrong, Liz. Okay, and how do you know it's right or wrong? Oh, well, you've got a, a measurable, well, you know, there's an outcome at the end. Okay, there's an outcome at the end, yeah. So the difference between, in my mind, the good and the right decision is the right decision you can only tell in hindsight. Okay? We farm, so we roll the dice a lot. Okay? You've got to make decisions now, the outcome of it is going to be six or 12 months down the track. 
And you'll look at that and go, geez, that was a good decision. You know, that was the right decision to make because look at all the money I made. Or you'll make a decision now and you'll look back and say, gee, I shouldn't have done that. That was a bad decision. I want you to separate out those two because we have to try and make good decisions and then roll the dice, keep our fingers crossed that it's going to work out to be the right decision. Okay? So we can do things to make our good decisions better at the time we've got to roll the dice, but it doesn't guarantee that it's going to be the right one. You know, if you'll pardon the French, shit happens. It happens in farming a lot. You, know, you can have the best bloody crop and you get a frost on it when it's flowering. Okay? You've all seen that. You know, oh, we put this crop in, the price of that drops, something else goes up. Jeez, I should have put canola instead of wheat. You know, we, we've all been through that and we're going to continue to go through that. So what I want us to focus on is this idea of getting a good decision. And how do you make a good decision? In my mind, a good decision is one you've thought through and it's informed. I'm going to touch on four points. First one and I'll talk about complex decisions. And I reckon what I heard today from the different presenters, it's a complex decision you've got to make. You know, it's not a simple decision. How many people have got livestock? If you have, you drench your sheep. How do you know how much to drench them? Look on the label, okay? And what's the label tell you? Weigh them. Okay, weigh them. So it's got a weight and so many mil per kilo of body weight, okay? That's a pretty simple decision. You can look up the recipe, you can look up the table. What you've got to grapple with from what Rob was saying and, and others were saying, Daniel was saying, is it's pretty complex. Lots of stuff going on there, okay? Now, complex decisions are influenced by three factors. I don't know if anybody's seen this before. I wish someone had taught me this when I started consulting. It's what I call the head, heart and gut of decision making. It is real, everybody sitting in this room does it. Okay, let me explain what it means. The head one's probably pretty obvious. The head one's the facts and figures. The numbers, the calculations, what's the gross margin, what's the this, what's the graph, tell me on that. Okay, agriculture's full of that. And as consultants, when I first started, this is all I concentrated on. Get the numbers right. How big's the gross margin? You know, gross margin of that is 200 bucks a megalitre, that's 80 bucks a megalitre, go for the 200, not the 80. And in my mind, that all seemed really logical. I'd present that case, come back six months later, they'd done the $80 one, not the $200 one. I'm thinking, why would you do that? There's other reasons why, okay? And in these complex decisions, if we think we only need to concentrate on the head bit of it, we're kidding ourselves, okay? There are other things that will influence your decision and not just the numbers, okay? I wish I'd known that because now I concentrate a lot more on understanding the heart and the gut when we're trying to make this decision, not just the heart bit of it. And we end up with much better decisions as a result. What do you reckon the heart refers to? What you like doing, okay? Your preferences, your values, your beliefs. The things that really matter to you. I'll get, just give you a couple of quick examples. I was doing one with a farm business. The son wanted to come back on the farm. He'd been at school. Uh, they were mainly cropping and they were going to bring livestock back in to diversify and expand and at least some land or whatever else. So I'd done all the numbers and it made sense to bring these livestock back in. I'm sitting around the table. My son was there and I said, oh, what do you think of this as an option? And he just looked at me and he goes, I hate sheep. <laughs> all right, <laughs> you should have factored that in. The numbers say it makes a lot of, you know, you can make a lot of money out of this. Right thing to do, can afford you to come in. Hate sheep. Why do you hate sheep? Well, every year when I'd come back from boarding school on holidays, there'd be 10,000 weathers to drench. I just hate them with a passion. Okay? Was that going to be a good decision, even though the numbers stacked up and they looked right? No, nah, it's going to be a lousy decision because they weren't going to do it well because it was a son they were relying on to do that. If he didn't have his heart in the job, he wasn't going to be done well. Give you another example. I sit on a couple of farm boards, just in an advisory type capacity, and it was one and a farmer had bought a header and he'd bought it from the local dealer rather than buying it from one of the bigger centres. It cost $10,000 more. And the accountant was sitting on the advisory board that we had as well. The accountant goes, well, it's $10,000 more. You know, it's one with four noughts after it. Go, yeah, I get that, <laughs> I get that. And so I asked the farmer, why'd you buy local? Why do you reckon? Service. Service was one, okay, so local service, what else? 
okay, in the community. They actually put an apprentice on this local farm business every year. It took one of the locals out, gave them an apprenticeship, so they became someone who was a real asset then in the community. And the third one is they sponsored the football and netball club. Okay, now for them, that was a very logical decision. That was a good decision, even though the accountant's saying, but it's one with four noughts after it. That's $10,000, you know, on the sheet, from a head point of view, that done that up. From a heart point of view, it does. And you know when people are talking through the, uh, in being influenced by the heart, is when they're willing to defend their position. And you think, that just doesn't make sense to me. But they're passionate about it. Okay, that's when you know that's happening. The third one's the gut. Anybody heard of gut feel? Okay, ever made a decision that you feel anxious about? Doesn't feel right in your guts? It's because your guts have actually got more nerve endings than your brain has. So that feeling of queasiness, of unease, is real. Okay? Your gut influences two things, or is influenced by two things. One, it's generally where we form our position on risk. It's not from the head, it's not from the analysis we do, it's from our gut feel. And that's from past experience. So as you've had those experiences, that starts to form a very important influence on the decision you're going to make. I do some teaching at Marcus Oldham, which is a farm management college just out of Geelong, and I do an exercise with them. And to compare that to what their parents would answer for the same opportunities or the same choices I've got to make, the students are far more, have much higher appetite for risk than what their parents do. And when you work out the difference between the two, it's because the parents have been around the block a few times. And they've seen things happen that haven't worked out the way they'd like them to work out or thought they'd work out. And so that influences their decision. Rob talked about the third, you know, the um, third as far as a third of loss compared to what the gain was. It's another fellow I'll mention in a tick, but his phrase for that was, the pain of loss is twice the pleasure of gain. In other words, if you lose 100 bucks and you want to erase that pain that you felt from losing that 100 bucks, you've got to make at least 200 or more before that will disappear. And I saw that very much in some grain stuff done about 10, 15 years ago. People took forward contracts. Those forward contracts were, ended up being a disaster. Everybody learned from that. The next year, an opportunity to take forward contracts really should have been what people were going for. And everybody goes, nah, once bitten, twice shy, not going there again. Okay. So realising that the gut has a huge influence is really important in that decision making. Okay. So think of that head, heart and gut and I reckon everybody will be able to think if I've got a big decision to make, those three are going to play a part. What I'll stress to you is don't hide them. Get them out, get them on the table. Because quite often when we have conflicts between people about thinking of a decision, it's because of the heart and the gut, not the head. Head's easy, you stick it out on the table, do the sums. Okay, it's the other bits that will influence it. Temperament is another bit. I haven't got time to go into temperament today. Rob talked about it. It is influential, the temperament, and how much the head, the heart, and the gut influence your decision making. Some people are just gut decision makers. So 90% of it comes from the gut and 10% from the head. Other people want to know all the numbers. Okay, nothing wrong with that. Just recognise that you might be strong in one and not the other two and the other two you need to bring into the thinking as well. Okay, second point of the theory I want to raise is understanding some of the risk around the decisions. Because believe it or not, so many of our decisions and what influences our decision, we have this risk overlay that we put on it, even though we don't necessarily make it very overt or very sort of public. Okay, risk by definition is likelihood by consequence. In other words, how often it's going to happen, what's the chances of it happening, and what are the consequences if it does happen? Okay? And there's a point where the risk gets to a level where you say, oh, it's that risky, I won't do it. And it's what I call my tipping points. Everybody will have those tipping points, but they'll be different tipping points. Okay? And we'll just delve into this a little bit further. And risk is very much personal and informed by your gut. I'm going to do a quick quiz. Everybody joins in on this. Don't think too hard about it because it's pretty simple. But you're a farmer, you're running a particular operation. Doesn't matter what it is. Yours can be an irrigation one if you like. Your farm operating profit this year was $200,000. Okay. 
Okay, so basically your profit, you made $200,000. Next year, you're going to make a choice or a decision. You're either going to keep the same operation, so do the same thing again and get a certain farm operating profit of $200,000, or you could change the operation. Okay, so you're going to make a decision to do something else. It might be change your crop type, buy more water, whatever you can do. Okay. If you change the operation, you've got a 50% chance of getting $400,000 and a 50% chance of getting nothing, okay? So you've got two choices. Choose the same operation, guaranteed 200,000, change the operation, 50% chance of 400, 50% chance of nothing. So it's an A or B thing. Which one do you choose? Who chooses A? Okay, who chooses B? Okay, one, one, <laughs> okay, two, two, okay. No, you're not going, John? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. When I do it with the marker students, about eighty percent go B. Why? Take a punt. Got thirty years harvest to go. Make up for it if it doesn't work. Now we all know there's a whole lot of backstory behind that. How much debt have you got? A whole lot of bits and pieces behind that in your decision making. But anyway, it's interesting to see the way those those two fall out differently. But for those that choose, uh, choose A, which is virtually everybody in the room, what if the enterprise mix, but there was a 60% chance of getting 400,000 and a 40% chance of getting zero? How many would now choose, instead of having a guarantee 200,000, would go with that? Anybody? One, two, three? What if there was a 70% chance? How many would go for it? Okay. And anybody that's rusted on, 90% chance, 400,000. Okay. 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 All right. So what's that tell us? First thing to say is that, oh, this point doesn't work, does it? They're risk statements. A 60% chance of 400,000, a 40% chance of nothing is telling you the risk because the 400,000 is the consequence. The 60% chance is the likelihood. So when we start understanding that risk, there is a certain point where people said, no, it's 60, 40, I wouldn't do it. 70, 30, yeah, I'll have a crack. And that's what I mean by these tipping points. You will describe there will be points where you say at that level or that amount, I would do this, but once it gets above this, I'll do something else. Believe it or not, we all have them and it all influences our decisions. We do this regularly. You just don't know it, but in the back of your mind, that's exactly what's going on. You're going, oh, that's a bit risky you'll just come to that conclusion. That's a bit risky, okay? If we can start to get our heads around this and start to find where those tipping points might be, that'll help in your decision-making. Third one in the theory, and towards the end. Commonly, there are many critical factors to weigh up. If you've got a difficult decision to make, there will be a number of things you need to consider. Okay, if there's only one or two, if you're drenching sheep and you go, yep, they need a drench, how much do I drench them? Pretty simple, one thing to consider, weight for the type of drench you're using, that's what you drench them to. But in most of our decisions, we've got these pros and cons. You know, on the positive side of the ledger, we've got this, this, this and this, which should be in our favour. Oh, but on the other side of the ledger, we've got this, this and this. Okay, six or seven things we've got to consider. Some of them on the four side, some of them on the, the negative side. And we should be making those decisions on balance. So that pros and cons thing, if we've got more on the pros side than the cons side in your mind, that's when you should be making that decision to say yes, or jump one way compared to jumping another way. So we should make them on balance. But a critical aspect of this is that not, of them, not all of them are of equal importance. So you can't say, I've got seven things I've got to consider, four on the positive side, three are on the negative side, therefore four is bigger than three, therefore we go with that one. They might be four or five smaller things, and there are two really big things that are very highly weighted or of much higher importance that we need to consider as well. People sort of follow that concept and idea. You'll all be doing it. Because when I sit down with the farmers I work with and we work through this process I'm going to talk to you about in a minute, they will list those whole range of factors and I'll go, oh, that's far more important than that one. I need to consider these other things, but by themselves they're less 
by themselves than something else is. But if I've got lots of little ones, they all add up together. On balance, they may actually tip in favour to do something else. So understanding what those critical factors are and their importance is a, a um, vital part of it. So how do we bring that bit of theory together? To bring in your head, heart and gut, which I said was really important. To incorporate that risk bit, because that's personal. Everybody will be different. When people put their hands up around the room, not everybody jumped at the same time. Okay, they didn't jump at the same time because you're all thinking in the back of your mind, oh, I'd want 70% to 30% or I'd want 90% to 10% before I do it. It's not right or wrong, it's just your position on it at that point in time. So it's a personal thing. Okay, and we've got to weigh up these multiple factors that may not be of equal importance. And the last one I'll just chuck in is this one. Balance timeliness against time to think. Has anybody heard of this fella Daniel Kahneman? Anybody? Rob has, okay. Daniel Kahneman is a professor at Princeton University in the US. He won a Nobel Prize for his work on this, which is about thinking and decision making. And if it's not a holiday read, I made the mistake, or actually my wife made the mistake of buying me that as a holiday read. I got through about 20 pages, so oh, but hell, this is a bit heavy. Okay. But if you, to distill that down, he basically says, we make decisions too quickly. And if we can just spend a little bit of time to slow down, to think about it, then we will make far better decisions going forward. What we tend to do is we do them on the run. You'll be driving home in the ute, you'll be thinking about it by the time you open the door and get out the farm, you made your decision. Okay? He's saying, no, no, slow down a bit and start to think about those sort of things. Okay? So that's the fourth bit that we want to sort of include in this process I'm going to talk to you about. Anybody know that bloke? Probably wouldn't from the... Sorry? <laughs> I'm having a guess it's not. Um, anybody know where Port Germain is? Yeah, over in the top of South Australia. Okay, this is a farmer, Barry Mudge, he's also an ag consultant. Her family have been farming about 100 k's north of Port Germain um, in South Australia, uh, six generations. Okay. Anybody know what the goiter line is? Yeah, what's the goiter line? Cut off is too dry. Cut off His farm backs onto that. Okay. Very successful farming business has grown over six generations, and particularly the last generation that Barry's been involved in. His sons are now back on board. One of the big decisions he's got to make every year is how much crop he sows. It might sound like a pretty silly thing to say, but in that marginal rainfall country, if he makes a mistake on that, it costs a lot of money. A lot of upfront costs, no way of putting water on. And so when I was speaking to him many years ago, he goes, oh, I use this simple process to go through to decide how much crop I sow. Now he's had some years where basically the cedar stays in the shed and all the neighbours are ripping around, raising dust, fingers crossed, hoping it's going to rain. Now he ends up buying the neighbours out in a few years time because he's making these decisions. Remember that decision before you roll the dice? And he's saying, if I look at what are the critical things that I need to think about in my sowing decision, what are they? What's the weighting on those? And every year he goes through the same process. Some of them he says are just no-brainers. Of course you go and do it. But he uses the same process every year and learns from it. I got it from him first, so I give him credit for that. I'm gonna show you that process now, just to step through, okay? I've got examples of this, it's called a decision matrix, um, but it's a relatively simple process once you get your head around it. I've got clients now, I've been using this for probably the last 10, 15 years. Uh, I've got clients now that if we've got a big decision to make, they will do a decision matrix before they, send it, before they call me. So I've done a matrix, can you have a look at this? You know, I want to discuss whether we should buy the block next door. You know, if I'm gonna lease some more land, you know, let's think our way through that change lambing times, whatever it might be. So it's a process you can use virtually for anything. Okay, this is how the steps go. First of all, be clear on what the decision is that you've got to make. Now, we've been, I've tried to do one that's a bit relevant to the work that, uh, and the talks that we've had this morning. So this is an irrigation one, and I'll put my hand up right up front. I know nothing about this sort of stuff. So what I've actually listed here, you might look at it and go, oh, I wouldn't agree with that, that's fine. 
Okay, if you look and go, I wouldn't have included that, I would have included this, or my tipping points in here, I would have different ones to that, or my relative weightings on this are different, that's fine. Okay, use it as understanding the process and the steps to go through rather than thinking this is the answer that you need. It's the process rather than the, the actual result. But I've tried to do something that's a bit relevant to what we're talking about. So first of all, define the decision. Decision here came up with, should I buy temporary water? Okay, relatively simple decision, but as you know in the background, lots of things to think about to make sure you make a good decision around that one. The second one for some of these is you need to define when the decision is made. We farm at home, we've got about half a dozen of these that we use during the year. Everything from decisions to destock, using ni nitrogen to grow more winter feed if we need to and so on. We've got a number of them through the year, spraying paddocks and so on. Um, defining when they need to be made and using them every year helps refine them and make them better. So it's optional sometimes, you know, are we gonna buy land? Should we buy that block next door? It's not really a, a time dependent decision. You've either got to make it or you don't make it. Some of them repeat every year. Every year you're faced with the same decision. Third step is just list the major considerations. Well, what I've got in brackets here, the critical factors that should influence a decision. So if you were thinking of buying temporary water, what's something you think you should consider? Price of water, okay, good, one. What's another one? How much you can produce with it, okay? Any others? How much other water might be available by the storage of that allocation? Okay, okay, so you would, I reckon, if I got everybody to sit down with your pad and paper and write them down, you'd come up with a list of six or eight, what you think are the critical factors. Are you cool with that? It's a pretty easy way of sort of thinking about it. Okay, so you list those, it should influence a decision. These were six that we came up with. Now you might look at it and go, oh no, I wouldn't have included that one. I'll include something else. So what we had there was the water price, whether we had land available. So if everything that we had allocated, all the land that we had that was potentially available to put extra water on, had already been allocated and we were using it for something else, might make us think a bit differently compared to if I had land that I could actually use that water on. Input costs, expected price of the, the crop, all the commodities being grown, things around labour, things around timing of operations and so on. So just to brainstorm for 10, 15 minutes with John, Adrian, Sally and Rob, and these were some of the things that dropped out. Not a definitive list because we did it in about five minutes, okay? but that's what you come up with, that sort of thing. So you generate a list and you just make them in a column like that. Okay, step four, for each of those critical factors, you ask yourself, at what point would I think differently about that response? So in other words, these tipping points that I was talking about before. So, I've got a hint there, describe the most favourable and least favourable results that support the decision. So if we take the one around water price, as say one of the critical factors, the next column that then you create is you think about what would be, in my mind, the most favourable result that would say yes to buying temporary water. And I've got there that if the water price was less than 10 bucks a megalitre that I could buy it for. I go, if I could get it for 10 bucks a litre or less, or 10 bucks a megalitre or less, um, that would be perfect. What in my mind would be, if it's above such and such a price, that's not really a good, um, a good option. And I've got there more than 100 bucks a megalitre. Now you might argue, no, that should be five bucks and it should be 300 bucks or something. Doesn't matter, okay? All you want to think about is the discipline in this process of saying that's the first critical factor. What's the most favourable result that I think, yep, thumbs up, I'd really go for that. And then think the reverse. If it got to that, I'd go, nah, nah, too much. Okay, that's all you're trying to create, just those tops and bottoms. And I, they bookend, if you like, the um, tipping points. And then in this case here, you can split them up further if you want to into different ones. Everybody follow that? Okay, so, and it's a discipline of taking just each one in turn, doing the most favourable one, least favourable one, and then anything that you might have in between. Why don't I just do the last one and say, anything less than that and I'll go for it. <coughs> Why do I do those earlier ones? Uh, sorry? Why don't I just say, more than 100, I'm out of it, less than 100, I'm in it. Why do I need all those others? Oh, okay, yeah, good question. Okay, 
The reason why we've got other ones in there is that remember we've got a number of critical factors and each of them can be more or less important than the others. So it might be that even though the water price is 50 to 100 megalitres, uh, 150 to 100 dollars per megalitre, okay, and you think, oh, that's pretty pricey, oh, it's not very nice at all, all those other critical factors all stack up in your favour. So on balance, even though the price of water's high, all those other things are going for you. And on balance, it's still a good decision to make, even though water's pretty high. If some of those other things are on the negative side as well as the 50 to 100, it might tip the scales down to, no, nah, don't do it. So that's the reason why we split them up into more than one. Okay? Everybody follow that? And the sort of reasoning behind it? Because I've got some great examples that I can direct you to later on where nothing's perfect. Nothing all stacks up in your favour. You're always in that bloody grey area. Because if it's everything's perfect or everything's crap, the decision's pretty easy. Don't have to think too hard about it. It's the bit in between. It's that grey bit in between. And it's the ones that are making the good decisions in the grey bit in between more often than others are the ones that are getting ahead. Okay, if we put all that together, that's what it looks like. I'm not going to go through it all in, in detail. I do have some handouts of that, but Sandy can send them out as well because I've only brought 10 of them. Um, but if you take just something as simple as, um, say, like the expected price of the commodity being grown, as simple as, is it above the long-term <laughs> average? Is it around the long-term average or below the long-term average? Could be all the descriptor that you want to use. If they were weather forecast, sometimes it's, you know, decile seven or better weather conditions or it's a decile three or below. So some of those can be descriptive. They don't necessarily all have to be numbers. They can just be ways that you think about it. You know, labour, difficult to source, labour, easy to source. It's as simple as that. And you'll go through in your mind and go, yeah, I can get labour easily. Your neighbour might think, oh, I can't get labour. You'll answer the two things differently, even though it's exactly the same uh, critical factor you've got to deal with. Okay, buddy, right with that? All right, next step, assign values to each of these. Now, this is about trying to get that relative weighting. You know, because if I look back here, whoops, go back to that one, we've got six things down there, just as a bit of a brainstorm. Would you consider all of those six of being of equal importance? No, okay, so some are going to be more important than others. The reason why we then try and put values on it is because we know that. That's the reality of it. So let's somehow try and put some values on that as far as relative to each other and their importance. Okay. So that's the next step. You assign values to each of those descriptions. And the hint that I suggest here in going through those steps is for each of them, you put your least favourable descriptions. In other words, the ones that wouldn't support you saying, yep, let's go and buy some temporary water as zero. So straight away, you put all of the worst ones as zeros. Okay, then we move on and we assign values to the most favourable descriptions relative to each other. Now sometimes when I do this with, with a farming or a farming business, we'll rank them first. So if you think back to this list, let's say this one here, we might have ranked them. So I would have said to them, out of those six, which one would you put at the top? Which one would you put next? Which one would you put last? So we sort of rank them before we start. So you can do that if you want to. haven't done it in this example here. So, these are numbers I made up, okay? You might look at them and go, geez, why did you give that twice whatever something else is? I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing, okay? But this is about you starting to think about the relative importance of those. So in this case here, I've valued water at price of less than 10 bucks a megalitre, twice as important as a, you know, a higher price for the commodity being grown. Okay, can people follow how I've sort of done that? Now, I'll keep stressing. Don't argue about the numbers. You might say, oh, I wouldn't have had that as five. I would have had that as seven. Change it to seven. Okay, because it's your decision. You've got to own the decision. It's the process of taking you through. Okay, so you put your top and your bottom numbers in. And then you fill out any of the other numbers in between. And so I've just made these up. Okay, 
Have I lost anybody there? Now, you know, when it came back to Daniel Kahneman saying, just take a little bit of time to think about it and put this together, okay? Because the biggest mistake we make is we jump to this too quickly. I can guarantee you, if you try and do one of these, it'll probably take you about 45 minutes to an hour. It'll be the best hour you spend. We teach this at Marcus Oldham now with the students. One of the students sent me an email after he'd done it. He said, I went back home and I sat down with mum and dad and we went through one of these. And he said, it's the first time I understand why they make the decisions they do. Because half of these things, those critical factors and those tipping points are up here. Not shared, just assumed. Okay, and the conflict you could see, why the hell are we doing this and not doing this? Oh, you're an idiot, you know, and you both walk away and do something else. Putting this out made a huge difference. Okay, you can argue over the numbers, you can argue what should the critical factors be, where the tipping points are. When you see different tipping points, and I've sat around a table where someone says the tipping point should be this, and someone else says, no, no, it should be this. It's your different temperaments and your tolerance to risk and stuff like that that comes into it. But at least you know where those differences are. Okay, so getting to the end of it, decision descriptions, the decision we're thinking about is should I buy temporary water? And so what I suggest to people is if you're trying to think, so all we've done up to here, all we've done there is create some thinking around what are the important factors, what are the tipping points and what are the relative weightings. Haven't made a decision yet on what we're going to do. But what this has done is force us to think about the stuff before we think about what decision should we make. And it's an important step to separate those two out. But once you've got that, we go through this process. Read all the best descriptions. So, if I said to you, the water price is less than 10 bucks a megalitre, we've got land that's free, available and ready to go. If we did, want, if we did buy water, our cost of our vital inputs, things like nitrogen, are lower than normal. The expected price of the commodity that we might be growing is above the long-term average. We can easily get labour and we can easily do things on time, so the timing of operations is going to be perfect. What decision would you make? You'd buy water, wouldn't you? Okay, pretty bloody obvious. Everything's stacking up in your favour. Yep, buy water. So you write that down. If all of them were perfect, what would I do? I'd buy water. <coughs> then do the opposite. Read all the worst decisions. Water's more than 100 bucks a megalitre. I'd have to sacrifice the current crop I've got in for this um, to free up some land and I anticipate these will be high return crops anyway. So what I'd be sacrificing with this water that I'm buying is actually going to be good value anyway, crop. Okay, input costs are higher than normal. The price of the commodity I might grow is below the long term average, difficult to source labour and would struggle to get things done on time for whatever reasons. What would you do? Do nothing. Do nothing. You wouldn't buy, would you? Because there are, yeah, this we're finished. Okay, so there's a couple of things there that, or a number of things there that aren't in your favour. So, decision, don't buy water. Now I've simplified this. So, once we've got that, what you do, step, step seven, is you add up the maximum score, which would be 40. So if you looked at all those numbers I put together, you take all the maximums and that would be 40, and you assign some preliminary splits to the maximum score. Now. I'll show you this and I'll explain a little bit more about it. So the two decisions we had is yes, buy water or no, don't buy water. They're the two extremes. Sometimes there's something in between where you might buy some. Hedge your bets and buy some. Okay, because there are some decisions where it's not just black and white. It's not just a yes or no. There's, there's some grey area in between. So we take the number 40 and then we come up with a number here or a score here. So if when we went through and checked that all off, it was greater than 25, then we'd go and buy water. If it was less than 25, we wouldn't. How do I come up with this 25? It's about the level of risk that you want to take on. So if you had a lower tolerance to risk, in other words, more things needed to be in your favour, the score would need to be higher before you'd say yes to it. If you've got a stronger appetite for risk, that score could be lower because you're willing to take a punt. You're willing to go 60%, 400,000, 40% of nothing, where someone else might say, no, I want 70, 30 before I do it. 
And these numbers, I can tell you this, this comes from financial stuff. We're actually doing some work with Marcus Oldham on this at the moment to try and find out the risk tolerance in agriculture because it's never been done before, believe it or not, even though we're one of the riskiest businesses in town. Okay, we haven't done this sort of stuff. So this comes from the finance sector. But it's exactly the same. You ever done something with a share port or with a, a financial advisor and they take you through this checklist and they say, you know, do you want it in shares? Do you want it in bank bonds? Do you want it in this or whatever else it might be? Based on exactly the same stuff. They just have a scoring system and your appetite for risk informs how much do they buy in speculative shares? How much do they buy in Blue Ribbon shares and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So all you do is take that number, the 40, and you multiply it by that. So in this case here, I've used the moderate, the high risk sort. So in other words, 40 multiplied by about, sits around there, about 6.5, that's where you get your 25 out of 40 from. So if you've got lower risk tolerance, if you're a low risk tolerance, that would need to be 32. So 40 times 0.8, that number up there would be 32, not 25. If you had a high risk tolerance, that number would be 22. In other words, less things need to be in your favour to get that right. And then the last thing we do is just test that scenario. And so I go through here and I say to people, have you ever bought water on the temporary market before? How many have? Yep, most people have. Okay, you've got experience and two things about that. You've got experience on it and you know the outcome. So you can look at that result and say the right decision to have made in that circumstance should have been this. Okay, because you know the outcome. You know the right decision, if you like, at the end. Even though I told you, you've got to roll the dice beforehand. But you've got history on your side, you've got a form guide on the side, you would be able to tell you what the outcome was. And so I say, think of an example like that and go through and score it for that example. And when you get to your number at the bottom here, and let's say it was 22, and you think, what was the right thing to have done in 2018? Should I have bought temporary water? and no, you shouldn't have, would be a conclusion that you'd come to, and that comes to 22, then that's supporting what you're talking about. So history is a fantastic way of helping to refine these. If it had come out and it said 30, and you go, nah, the right decision was to not buy water, and this is telling me to buy water, there's something wrong in my numbers or the things I'm considering. And to go back to that one with Barry Mudge, when Barry Mudge first started, one of his critical factors was what the seasonal forecast was for the season when he was going to plant in April, May. Okay? Another one of his critical factors is how much stored soil moisture he had. He put a lot of weighting to start with on seasonal forecast. And over time, he realised seasonal forecast, I should put less weighting or importance on because of history and how much moisture I've got in the ground when I'm going to put that seed in the ground is far more important. So the two of them over time flicked over. Because his experience every year refined it and made it better and better and better. Okay? He, can grow a he can grow a profitable wheat crop on 110 mil moisture. It's pretty good going. It's pretty good going. Okay, and adjust that if required. Okay, what I like about the matrix and the final slide, John, slows down your thinking. I could tell you if you try and do something like this, it might take you an hour, hour and a half or whatever else in total to get it done and to play around with it and all that sort of stuff. Time worth spent, well spent. As I say, I've got farmers now that can do this in half an hour. Got a big decision, they make one of these up for me, then they send it to me and say, I'd like to chat about this. And that is an unbelievable process to get them to that point. Second one, and I've touched on this, makes it transparent for others to contribute and follow. Tell you what, if you try and do this yourself or you do it with two or three people sitting around the table, you'll get a much better one with the two or three sitting around the table. Because there will be things you won't think about, things you will take for granted that someone else says, no, nah, that should be included. And you'll argue the toss over what their value or weighting should be because of all everybody's experience, level of risk they want to take on, you will end up with a better one because of that. You refine it over time, which I've touched on. Every year, we've had some of these now for six years on the farm, six to eight years on the farm. Every year, we pull it out every year, we make sure, is there anything we learnt from last year that would change the weightings or the values that we've got? Last one we pulled out was the end of May, when we're deciding over the next three months, do we need to grow more feed? 
before we get to our magic spring period, okay, for our calving and lambing. And there's five or six things we consider in that. Things like condition score of the animals. If the animals are in good condition, our feed's a bit light, we still might, may not grow more feed because we'll just take it off the animal's back. Okay, what the seasonal forecast is like. All of those sort of things come into it as well. Okay, and importantly in this last one, it narrows down what information you acquire and the skills you need. Once you've created something like this, I know that I need to be able to find what the water price is going to be. Because how else do I know to give it a 12, an 8, a 6 or a 0? So I know what bit of information I need. What available land have I got? Let's sit down and just have a consideration of, oh, could we take that crop out? Could we do this? Have we got this? Would we, could we spend some money and land plane that and pick that paddock up and make it available for us? So it makes you think about, if you like, the right things. And we're in a day and age where we're just bombarded by information. We have so much stuff out there and you get it on your phone and your moisture probe says this and your bloody weather thing does this and the, season, and the prices come in and they say this. But information flying around everywhere. A lot of it for something like that, you don't need to know to make that decision. So I do this and then I start looking at well, what skill do I need? What do I need to tick off on? rather than the other way around, having all this information coming in and trying to make use of it. You do it the other way around. All right, if that process, I went through that really, really quickly. If you want to, um, let me say, understand the discipline of this, there's a thing called decision wizard that we called it. Um, I'll make sure that, that Sally's got the contact for this. Uh, Sandy, sorry. Sandy's got the contact for this. Um, it just takes you through those eight steps, which are the things up the top. Decision and timing, considerations, conditions, values, and so on. It forces you to go through those steps so you can't jump. Okay, you can go backwards and forwards, but it forces you through those steps. Also, when you get in there, there's a whole lot of other examples. So you create your own ones, you can keep them private, but if you're happy to share them, they don't know who's sharing them, but if there was an irrigation one on there, um, that would be there. Other people can log in, go, oh, there's an irrigation example, I might get some ideas from that. Okay. It's all free, you just get on. Any ones you've made privately, you keep, and you can get back on and edit it yourself. And there's a 10 or 12 minute video. This is, features my wife and I, one of us is very good in it, one of us is pretty average. Okay. But it goes through one of the decision matrices we use at home on the farm. How we built it, how we use it. So if you just think, oh, I wouldn't mind just having a bit of a recap on that, that's a simple video. If you just type in building a decision matrix on YouTube, it'll come up. And that's it.